and we are live. Welcome everyone. Uh, it is Tech Excellence. My name is Daniel and I will be the co-host of this session. I would say uh, let's get started. Tech Excellence, our vision is to raise the bar of technical excellence across the world. Uh, here are our organizers. Uh, first and foremost, Valentina Tupac, our founder and organizer. Next to her, we have uh, Alina Liburkina. Uh, she is also co-organizer. Uh, next to her, we have Oliver Ziller, another co-organizer. And last but not least, uh, Daniel Mokahmi, uh, another co-organizer and the main host of today. Uh, yeah, here are our speakers from the past. Uh, uh, don't forget that all of these are recorded and uh, can be accessed in uh, YouTube. So uh, check them out if you are interested. And here you can see the, also some of the history and also uh, pay attention to the uh, speakers of the future. We will have a lot of great and exciting session planned already. Uh, yeah. Uh, we can be found in online in a lot of platforms. Uh, first of all, of course, techaccess.io, our main website, but you can also follow us on Meetup, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, GitHub, and last but not, not least on Discord, we have a very great uh, community. Uh, feel free to join. Uh, yeah, huge thanks to our sponsor, Optivem, and thanks to our partner, QE Unit. Tech excellence, learn how to deliver quality software faster. Uh, yeah, let's talk about the topic of today. We have a great uh, speaker today called uh, Gary Quest. Hey, Gary. Uh, Gary is an extreme. Garrick is an excellent programming coach and software crafter. He's raising the bar of professional software development by building quality software and helping others learn how to do so. He spent uh, most of his time with development working, doing pair programming, more programming, test run development, uh, refactoring, continuous integration, continuous deployment, so namely everything about extreme programming. And he also has experience in numerous programming languages and application stacks. Uh, the title and the topic of today is the tactical TDD introduction. So we're going to talk about test run development today. I'm super excited. And before I hand over the microphone, I would like to let the audience know that if you have any question uh, during the session, then uh, feel free to ask them uh, in the YouTube chat section. And uh, after the talk, we're going to uh, dedicate some time to answer all the questions. So yeah, Garrick, welcome. Uh, the stage is yours. Uh, good luck. We are super excited. OK. Thank you very much. Um, so. Uh... I um, was asked to uh, was asked to do a presentation for Tech Excellence. Uh, very honored to do so. And um, when we were talking around, um, you know, possible uh, different topics and who the audience is, um, I, I'd thrown out a few ideas, and and one of them was, you know, just kind of generally talking about TDD, and um, that uh, that seemed to be uh, have the most uh, interest. And and then I thought to myself, I thought, well, wait a minute. Um, I've kind of been um, doing this for a while, uh, for better or worse. And so um, what can I say about TDD that hasn't already been said? And then I realized um, I have a little bit of an interesting perspective because uh, while I did it, started doing it about, like I said, a number of years ago, 20 years ago, I thought to myself, um, what would I want to know possibly starting from zero to getting a successful path, what would it look like? What's a successful path to go from zero to TDD in 2023? Um, and so I thought, okay, so there's three things that need to be considered. First of all, talking about a, a, a decent definition of, of TDD, um, which seems simple, um, but uh, you know, I think in some cases uh, needs a little bit um, more nuance. Um, what does it take to support TDD? And then what would be kind of a guide, kind of a roadmap um, that you might want to follow if, if you knew nothing or, or you knew very, very little, um, or even if you're somewhere along that journey, um, kind of trying to figure out, it's like, well, did I miss something? Um, how do I want to move forward with this? So that was where I took the ideas. And um, as it is, part of the um, challenge with TDD starting to go from zero is that in some cases I looked and there's, there's a lot of information. There's a lot more information about TDD than there was 20 years ago. And unfortunately, there's also some bad information. 
Um, a lot of times people think, oh, TDD. Uh, yeah, that's just unit testing stuff. Um, myself and some um, other consultants and, and developers I've worked with over the years, uh, we've gone through the hiring process, either uh, contract or full time. And we've asked people, people that have put TDD on their resume, come to find out that they just think that means unit testing. Um, a surprising and disturbing number in some cases. Um, some people think that, oh, TDD means you write all the tests first, and that's just ridiculous. Or that um, TDD in and of itself can exclude architecture and design, uh, that it's all about uh, improving test coverage. And in some cases, it's like, well, you know, hey, if you do TDD, then you don't really need to QA stuff. It can be replacement for, like, you know, anyone doing any QA work. Um, and, and all of those are, are really wrong. Um, the resources has changed. Uh, I started out with uh, the book Test Driven Development by Example. And nowadays, what got me thinking is taking a look, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there in terms of uh, videos and blog posts and examples. And so I started sampling and looking at those and came up with an idea of what a roadmap might look like. So um, getting out of these and in order to complete uh, my goals for this talk, let's start off with that definition of TDD. Um, there you go. Uh, okay, so uh, we're gonna have plenty of time here because I've already obviously covered one of my three goals. Um, TDD is a design approach, Kent Beck. Um, can't, get, uh, can't get better than that in terms of, um, in terms of getting a definition from uh, the person who uh, came up with and popularized the concept. Um, and then actually that's, that's a little unfortunate. Um, I think, uh, Kent Beck is great at programming, but terrible at marketing. Um, love him to death. But, uh, part of the problem with the TDD acronym is that in so many cases, people hear the word test and the brain kind of shuts down and they think, oh, well, this is, this is, this is about writing tests. It's about writing tests. It's like, no, it's not about testing. It's about design. Um, for what might have been my alternate life, either in stand-up comedy or marketing, uh, the thought that went into my brain was, no, this is DDT. Uh, this is design driven by test, um, which is then a great riff off of the um, uh, horrible, uh, widely available up until I think the 1970s, uh, DDT chemical that was uh, used to kill bugs. Um, and uh, hey, <laughs> we love killing software bugs. So yeah, kind of the tagline writes itself. Um, but, uh, that's not what we have. Um, we, we have that TDD acronym, so we're not going to change that. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in, in my mind, what I try and tell people is, you know, don't, don't think of it as, as, as about tests, think about a design and that the tests are the tool to create the design. Um, so, um, the question is, okay, so how? How do we do this specifically? We've, we've got a definition. Um, having a definition is usually fine, but a lot of times it's helpful to get a little more uh, information fleshed out about it. So how can you have design driven by tests? Um, the irony is that it's actually very concise and pretty straightforward. That's the good news in terms of, of getting started. Um, I think of a little bit like the uh, concept of people talk about uh, the game of Go um, or chess, the idea that it you know, can take a few moments to learn uh, and a lifetime to master. Um, and so you can sit down and in a pretty short time learn to follow the red-green refactor cycle, write a failing test, uh, make the test pass, um, and then refactor. And the caveat there is that while you're doing so, you're following Uncle Bob's three laws. Uh, for those of you who might, be, might not be familiar, in the uh, software crafting community, um, Robert Martin uh, kind of goes by the tagline, the name Uncle Bob. And when he started doing TDD and really getting impressed with it, he recognized um, what uh, he called out as three laws of um, TDD. The notion that in order to do TDD and follow red, green, refactor, you... Uh, you only write production code enough to pass a failing unit test. Um, you write no more of a unit test than is sufficient to fail, and compilation failures are fine. And you write no more production code than necessary to pass your one failing unit test. So you're working in these small steps. Um, and then the notion of what you're doing in the cycle as you're looking at it is informed by the four rules of simple design. When you're looking at your code, you say, okay, so 
Do I pass all the tests? Um, does my design reveal intention? Um, is there no duplication? And does this have the fewest elements? So that's a, um, that's a pretty good setup and a definition for what is TDD and what does it look like? All right. Well, that sounds good. The next question is, how do you support that? Um, being able to do all those things uh, is, is fine, maybe in a small, simple toy example. Um, but if you are going to do TDD um, in production, in working software, in things that are shipped to, to customers, to users, um, asking yourself, okay, so what do I need to do in order to support doing that well? And what came to me in terms of a comparison is recognizing that while well, you can start out with those rules, there's some foundational things when you start exercising those practice more and more that become essential. The idea that you've got some sort of foundation that if you can't do some of the basics, you're going to have trouble taking TDD and, and applying that for, for design. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, at least to me, uh, the analogy I came up with was uh, one from my childhood from the world of skateboarding. And that was recognizing that there's a fundamental trick called the Ollie. Hopefully the video will play here in a moment. They have a great one example in slow motion where the whole point is to launch the rider and the skateboard into the air. That you can be in motion. You can jump up and bring the board with you to hop over a curb, to um, jump into a half pipe, whatever it is you might be doing. And this is also the foundation for a number of tricks. And so if you don't have that foundation, or as I'm saying here, if you can't ollie, you can't do a kickflip. The kickflip is where you do the ollie, and in the process, you actually turn the board over completely. Another thing I couldn't do. Again, full transparency. I spent a while learning this. I tried it on the grass. I never got good enough. And uh, I managed to uh, pretty pretty severely uh, break my left arm when I was young skateboarding. And so the threat from my father was that if I broke another bone, I'd lose the skateboard. Uh, funny thing, years later, uh, he rides horses. And he has broken more bones riding horses than I ever did skateboarding. And so at some point, we may need to have a little discussion uh, and sit down with my mom and figure out um, when does this come into play that uh, if you break so many bones doing it, that it gets taken away from you. But that's that's a story for, for another time. Um, TDD is a bit like this. And hopefully you'll forgive me. I have, a, I have a coworker here. I have a feline coworker who's insisting on getting attention. Her name is Boo. She's my emo she, I'm her emotional support human. Um, pardon me, but going back, um, TV is a bit like this, this idea that you need the foundation, you need to be able to do the ollie so that you can do the kick flick, you can do all of those sorts of tricks. And in the case of TDD, what that ollie is, it's getting the foundation of knowing how to write unit tests, um, having a sense of design and getting some refactoring. So Okay, the next question is, well, how do you do this? How do you build up that foundation? What does that foundation look like? Well, ironically, um, and I've um, borrowed this from, uh, from one of our uh, hosts, um, I saw this, this, this really spoke to me because um, I've, I've run into some of this challenge um, in, my, in my consulting life, um, trying to get effective TD at an organizational level. Um, this can be true, of course, for any project. The question becomes, um, in order to, to bring in TDD, um, if you assume that you've got um, some level of support and psychological safety and you've got tools that basically work, getting this next level here, you can see level three, this maintainable software to be able to go and do design and make changes. Well, what do you need? What makes effective code? What makes effective tests? And what makes a testable architecture? Um, Easily enough, in order to support effective code, um, I actually have a great acronym, one of my favorite acronyms. It's the tech world. We all love acronyms, right? Um, effective code is ETC, easy to change. Um, the fun thing about that is that it encompasses a lot of stuff. 
what makes code easy to change. Um, whether you've done it test driven or you've done it test after, do you have good test coverage? Um, is it clean? Is it well designed? Is it readable? Um, do you have uh, ways to, um, to to go in and refactor safely? Again, effective tests, uh, which will be coming up next. Um, there's all sorts of things. Is that if if code is easy to change, then you're starting to build out that that good foundation for being able to do comfortably do um, drive your design with tests. So effective tests. Um, this is a bit of a shorthand, and it's been around for a while. Some people argue for and against, but I like it. And given my focus, I'm still a fan of what I've promoted to developers, managers, executives as the pyramid over the ice cream cone, which is to say, and uh, the pyramid design on the left, uh, this was credit where credit is due. This was taken from a blog post by Martin Fowler, um, was the notion that you have a basis of unit tests. And when I say unit, um, I'm very particular about those. Typically, I say unit tests involve two things, RAM and CPU. Um, with modern systems, if your tests can be focused using RAM and CPU, you have a level of cores and multiple threads in the modern day desktop and an amount of RAM that we could only dreamed of 20 years ago that make unit tests using RAM and CPU ridiculously cheap and ridiculously effective. Um, those arrows on the side where you've got the rabbit tests running fast and the sense in terms of US currency of the cost going down. Unit tests that way are awesome. Service level tests, those tend to be things that might pull in, you know, a database, um, maybe some sort of ready to a file system. Uh, heaven forbid, if you're doing something complicated, you might have something tricky like uh, um, a network sockets resources you have to manage. Uh, you might have graphics context, possibly depending on what you're doing. That sort of idea. Um, and then the UI. And as you go up the pyramid, these things get costlier to maintain and they get slower. Unfortunately, what we see very often is we will end up seeing um, the ice cream cone in worst case scenarios, especially in larger organizations that tend to silo uh, development from testing, um, where you will have a very small number of unit tests. You might get a little more integration tests, but you'll get heavy reliance on automated UI tests, which are brittle. And unfortunately, this horrible crowd up top um, before, col uh, during college, actually, um, back in the late 90s when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I did manual testing. Um, I did not enjoy it. Um, I was happy to get in development and stop doing manual testing. Uh, it was very fun in the early 2000s when some of the early UI automation came forward. Uh, there was an application called Watir that would allow you to automate um, Internet Explorer which was great because unfortunately at the time, Internet Explorer had taken over the market. But the fact that you could script Internet Explorer and do UI testing and keep the clients happy was awesome. Uh, so anything to get away from this. Um, and ultimately, if you can do as little as possible, you're going to be in better position. So we've talked about code. We've talked about tests. Um, one of the things that can throw a bit of a wrench into either of those is your architectural decisions. Um, this is where, and I've rendered these firsthand, I'm sure a number of other folks have as well. This is where in some cases you have to be careful. Um, one of the advantages with open source, uh, apart from the joke that uh, um, if you break it, you get to keep all the pieces, uh, is that you have um, more push from developers in terms of testability. And one of the challenges sometimes is depending on decisions that are made in the scope of a product, its life cycle, something that it does for a company and contributes value. In some cases, third party interests may have come in. And there are commercial products out there that do a really good job at supporting automated testing and unit testing and testing on developer systems. And there are some that do not. Um, this then sometimes becomes an important aspect, especially down the road if you are considering what might I want to look to as a project that uh, I want to 
uh, do TDD for? Um, does it have third-party re library requirements? If so, can I isolate those? Or are the ways that I can helpfully and carefully, um, strategically incorporate them into my development environment on my laptop, my or in the cloud, or some sort of test server? Um, again, hint, uh, if you're doing commercial versions of these, uh, they should be free for development and test. Um, if they're not, and you haven't written the check yet, uh, see who you can talk to. So um, in that vein of talking about getting to uh, easily testable code, uh, effective code, effective tests, and testable architecture, there's a few books out there um, some folks may be uh, familiar with. And I kind of tried to take these in a left to right in terms of impact. Um, if you're working on clean code and writing good code and you haven't quite gotten very well into testing yet, writing clean code is going to give you a bigger bang for your buck, I would argue, necessarily, than testing. It's kind of a layer. But starting out with writing clean code will help you write better tests. The second book I'm here... Um, well, I was unfortunate to find that it is out of print. Um, that's the bad news in terms of the physical. Uh, the good news is, I believe it's uh, Inform IT, uh, which is also a subdivision of, of uh, Pierce, uh, Person, Pearson Person Publishing. Uh, it's still available. And of course, you can get it as a PDF, which is fantastic because it is 949 pages. Um, even if you've done years of testing, this book in my opinion, is authoritative. Um, if you haven't looked through it before, if you get the opportunity, if it's been collecting dust on your shelf, flip through, uh, you will most likely find a reference to something that you'd either forgotten about or hadn't thought of that way. Um, it's, it's really good. It's really good in that regard. Refactoring, refactoring to patterns. Uh, refactoring in and of itself, giving you that um, understanding of the strategic ways of safely changing your code. Of course, test coverage is involved. And then this refactoring to patterns to me kind of fills in uh, that, that cool bit of um, architectural malleability uh, that TDD can give you. That idea of, okay, I can go along and change my architecture by creating an alternate path through my code and then proving that it's correct and, and working, and then gutting out the old path and having my tests stay green. Um, that's ultimately when you're, when you're comfortable, when you've got some, some, some knowledge of it and some experience, that refactoring to, into a pattern um, is, is really powerful and helps with that, um, that uh, architecture. So um, let's see now. We've gotten a definition of how to support TDD. Um, we've got a definition of TDD um, and some of the details. We've talked about supporting it. Um, let's talk about that roadmap. So um, for starters, there's an old saying, the map's not the territory. Um, but I will take a map over getting lost any day. Um, Going back and trying to put this into uh, into perspective, um, getting my first exposure to test-driven development and doing it really well um, was a uh, <laughs> a bit of a um, a bit of a fire hose. Um, <laughs> my very first job, uh, which I had stayed at for about um, seven and a half years. Um, was a great and terrible way to, uh, to learn. Um, the team was doing uh, full-on extreme programming from the 1999 white book, uh, doing it by the book. We had an XP customer. Uh, we were doing um, one-week iterations, if I recall. We were doing trunk-based development, continuous integration. Uh, fun fact, in 2004, uh, at the time, there was one piece of code that did continuous integration. Um, it was called Cruise Control, and it was written in Java. And that was it. Um, fortunately, it was open source because it fit our budget at the time. But um, we were doing all that. And um, on day one, I was able to sit down 
still learning, getting a feel for the problem domain and everything that else was going on, not having a lot of confidence, but I had a pair with me and we had test coverage, tests to talk back to us and tell us what we were going through um, and to help us understand what the code was doing. Um, the code style guidelines for this company was to take the Rogueway software's element, um, uh, let's see, what was it called? It was a riff off of Strunk and Wagnall's Elements of Style. It's called Elements of Java Style, which was a thin little book. They took an X-Acto knife and they cut out the chapter on comments and handed it to you. Um, can talk about uh, lack of comments later, possibly, as a setup for the Q&A. But this, after six months, um, was amazing. But I realized people aren't going to get that. So if I were starting from zero today, what would I do? And so I decided to steal from the mantra that medical schools use to teach surgery techniques. And that is to say, see one, do one, teach one. And in this case, I've taken the concept and I've gone with see it, do it, show it with regard to having your roadmap for learning TDD and taking a TDD journey. Um, there's the asterisk, asterisk here with this, with this great quote. This is also one of Steve Jobs' favorite quotes. Uh, Good artist copy, great artist steal. Um, I think in this case, and to give credit where credit is due, steal is a bit of a misnomer. Um, it's a little bit more of a remix or reevaluation. Um, but uh, I will also say that that was how I tried to structure things. Um, given what I do and how I do it, you'll notice a little a bit of iteration when I go through and show these. But here are kind of the, um, the tactical guide to TDD in five steps. So here's the big reveal. So the ID, the idea here is, is presenting to you how to see and do basic TBD. Um, I'm going to start with recommending a video. And more importantly, I'm going to call out what to watch for when you go through and watch the recommended video or any other videos. And when you see it, then go and do it and doing it with the basics. And when I say basics, I'm talking good old unit tests by my definition, RAM and CPU. Not talking about getting any more complicated of an application. Simple katas fall into this. Um, you say simple katas, but that's also what leads people to becoming a black belt, are simple katas. Step two, see and do something more advanced. This is where we'll get into and in talking about test doubles and things like that. And people realizing, hey, great, I have all this logic and it's in memory. How do I persist something? What happens if I have to call to an external service? We'll talk about some of those elements. Number three, uh, show as much as you're comfortable all the TDD you've learned. Um, you can show you what you learned. You can talk to people about what you unlearned. Um, one of the interesting factors when you learn TDD and you start improving the way you design things is you will end up unlearning old habits of how you were writing code. That's a good thing. Um, and then you'll recognize, of course, as is the nature of being lifelong learners as software craftsmen, uh, recognizing what you still don't know. Uh, number four, uh, this may or may not be exciting to people. This may be terrifying, but advocating for TDD, um, getting people comfortable with doing something new, dealing with a little bit of politics, heaven forbid. And then last but not least, some general thoughts and ideas on what successful piloting might look like, either in your organization or if you decide to go off and you want to do something open source. And if you have pushback from your organization and decide, I'm going to do this on my own, some ideas of how to take off and do that as well. So um, seeing and doing the basics. Well, um, you may recognize this, some folks. Um, you may recognize this individual, Dave Farley, um, one of my favorite folks. Uh, I love his YouTube channel. Uh, one of my favorite folks to follow on YouTube. Um, he has a tutorial for beginners. And there's a lot out there for others. I recommend starting here because I liked his approach because he covers all the same stuff that I'd be talking about if you asked me to sit down with you and do TDD and 
go back to this few slides we talked about before about Uncle Bob's three laws, the four rules. And so here's the questions. Um, and I think they're fair enough to jot down and use as a level of critique for any type of TDD video that you want to take a look at. Um, do they red, green, refactor? Uh, do they obey the three laws as they go through? Did someone just refactor something while they were in red? <gasps> Scandal. Um, do they frequently run the test? Uh, one of my favorites. Do they predict the test run? Let me tell you, um, whether it was coding something 20 years ago or 20 hours ago at this point, um, calling your shots and making that prediction is a wonderful way to reinforce what you're doing and what you think you know about the code base you're working on. Um, predictions and calling your shots is one of my favorite things with TDD. It's one of my favorite things to teach and show as well. And again, uh, for rules of design. And also, in terms of setup, uh, I have coworkers who get, who get real sticklers about this. And it's helpful when you begin to do your clearly calling out your arrange act assert. Um, sometimes people, although I'm not a big fan of comments when they're starting TDD, will call out comments among the blocks and say, this is arrange, this is act, this is assert. Um, so that's seeing the basics. How do I suggest you might go about doing it? Well, um, in terms of barrier to entry, 20 years ago, there was nothing quite as easy as Cyber Dojo. Um, because it's an online editor, you can go in, uh, it's free to set up and play around at the basic level, and it has a whole bunch of katas, and you can just try FizzBuzz on your own. You don't need to pull up your IDE, you don't need to create an entire project. But once you've done that, okay, pick a language and that you know and you're comfortable with the tools, maybe it's the language you work in at work, and try doing FizzBuzz, maybe a few other katas. Um, check it into your private GitHub reto repo uh, if you don't want to share it with the world. Um, scrutinize it. Think about it. Um, when you do this, getting familiar most often with X unit conventions are going to help. Uh, when you start doing this more, you'll start looking at how assertions are done, how tests are set up, uh, before each, after each. You'll kind of pick those up as you go away, but be aware of them when you go looking at these and you're watching the videos as well. Um, how are the tests set up? Getting your tests so they're not repeating so much is a lot of time a good thing um, that you can do. Even in FizzBuzz, uh, you can make an argument for uh, doing before reaches. And as you go through, think about how TV impacts design. Try some other katas. And um, it's interesting. FizzBuzz is very simple, but it's also very adaptable. There are all sorts of things that you can do with FizzBuzz. Um, a good friend and colleague of mine in Industrial Logic has done um, at the Seattle Software Crafters Meetup. I think you can search on YouTube. He has done an entire presentation on why FizzBuzz is the ultimate king of katas in terms of different approaches you can take and emphasize on how you do FizzBuzz and what restrictions you put your, on yourself when you do that. So that's a little concept for later. So that's the basics. That's act one. What does act two look like? Well, act two, you're going to get out of the world of RAM and CPU. Um, this I came across, and I loved uh, the, this uh, presenter's approach. Um, I'm not a C++ guy. I've, I've spent about a year, or C Sharp guy. I've spent about a year and a half. I do love the tooling. Uh, if you do um, write .NET code with C Sharp, there's a fantastic tool called NCrunch. Um, and it's not cheap, but it is worth every penny if you're doing TDD. Um, it is fantastic, and it shadow runs your test with as much extra cores and stuff as you can imagine and keeps running in the background while you're building. It is amazing. I wish there was something like it in the Java world and for other open source stuff. That said, um, this is a good video because he starts talking about testables. He goes in and takes my favorite approach, which is using fakes. We'll talk about some of the other test doubles coming up. Um, and actually going through and fake it till you make it for a service. Um, it's kind of a design point, but I prefer it. Um, a look for when you're watching videos that are doing advanced stuff and working with um, test doubles. Uh, do they write interfaces? Um, 
interface is not your implementation. One of the advantages of an interface is that it makes it easy to write a fake to. Or in some cases, depending on your tooling, back in the Java world years ago, that was the best way in order for some of the mocking frameworks to work. And I argue sometimes it still is. Um, again, do they prefer fakes to mocks? And um, sometimes, this is where things get gray. If you're moving out of RAM and CPU, is there a good reason to do that? Um, some tools and frameworks that you might use will have strong opinions regarding some of the test boundary stuff that I talked about with the pyramid. Um, Ruby on Rails comes along, and from day one, they said, your local development environment database is fast enough. Don't try and do fancy things in memory. Don't try and justify using something like an in-memory database. Um, Rails assumes that you have a dev test and production databases from day one when you start up and you work, you do your agile migrations of your schema right from there, and your tests for your active record objects just run against the database. Um, and I'm fine with that when I'm doing Rails. So now you've seen this, you've looked at a few things, just like you did before, you've seen it. Go ahead and do it. Um, this is where it's a little weird because a lot of times we'll say, well, what do I start with? I don't really have a project. Um, I think one of the best things you can do is do YAFTL, as I came up with a terrible acronym for, yet another mm -hmm, to-do list of a project. Um, just take the to-do list. Um, be able to add something, cross it off, delete it, whatever a to-do list does, and then start doing some more interesting stuff to it. Start with an in-memory version, because that's the easiest. Um, maybe it might be fun to just store it out as a flat file um, or use browser storage um, if you're doing something web-based. Uh, go off and change it to SQL. Or if you prefer, because it's a lot simpler, do it in NoSQL. Um, those are the points where things like, if you check out testcontainers.org, and the modern things that you can do in terms of testing, overall unit testing, integration testing, you can spin up and throw away a Docker container so ridiculously easy, especially when you take a look at the small footprint of a number of um, database systems even. A Postgres in and of itself with a few tables is incredibly small and cheap to spin up on modern hardware. Same thing for a lot of the document graph databases. Um, add calls to a service. There are a lot, <coughs> excuse me, there are a lot of um, services out there that will give you free access or um, I think like the NOAA uh, has free feeds of stuff because it's paid for the US with tax dollars. Um, so you get free uh, services that you can test out um, and work with integrating, coming up with ways to stub and fake those services, making sure that the contracts work, all that sort of stuff that you can drive through and, and do. When you do things, um, there's a few traps to watch for. Um, not Don't mock things that you don't own. Uh, you don't want to test the system. There's a famous pattern here that I've had to implement many times called the mock clock. Um, don't ask the system for a date and then assume that your test is going to work the next day because you did something silly by asking the system for a date. So those, those types of concepts. Ultimately, long story short, you want to isolate the uncontrollable and get it under control. And that's what will keep your testing and you a little more sane. So you've done the basics, you've done advanced. I've got a few other tips once you're getting into advanced that's going to kind of help give you ideas how to do those tests, what to look for, what to think about. And the first up, uh, while I can't claim uh, to being the genius that came up with the two acronyms, uh, I do know, uh, have uh, met, uh, worked with some of the geniuses that came up with the first acronym and briefly met at a conference, the genius that came up with the second acronym. But I'm the average guy who came up with the catchphrase that says, Put your test at the corner of first in zombies. Okay. Good to remember. Easy to remember, right? Let's get into what first means. Well, first is all about how your test could, should contribute to your code base. First says that your test should be fast, 
Your tests should be independent of each other. Your tests should be repeatable. You should get the same test results every time you run your tests. They should be self-validating. You've got to have some assertion statements. You've got to be checking something inside your tests. It may sound a little silly, but sometimes when people are starting out, they have trouble or they will go through and get into a corner and not recognize that their tests are really validating something. And they should be timely. Um, and in terms of timely, there's a little flexibility here. Uh, this applies whether you're using test first or test last, um, but your tests should be written roughly the same time you're writing your code. Um, you don't want to wait too long and get too far removed from your design and what you were thinking and how you were doing when you wrote your code. With TDD, you can't. With test last, you could end up drifting. So there's first. Zombies. Um, there's a great article here. I do have a reference for it. You can Google it as well. The author's name is James Grenning, and the article is called TDD Driven by Zombies. And the zombies acronym is, stands for um, what aspects, sorry, of your code the test should cover. So first is how they should run, what zombies is what they should cover. So a zero case, um, possibly something in passing in a null, but it's easy to skip. Um, the one case, the many case, boundary conditions. This is an important one. Also, um, going and dealing with your interfaces and kind of exercising exceptional behavior. Um, the idea of interfaces is that, of course, you're not necessarily testing private methods, but you're testing an object's interfaces. And then last but not least, your setup for these should be all around simple scenarios and solutions. So keeping your code as simple as possible when you're writing your tests. So that's tip number one. Put your test at the corner first in zombies. Tip number two. Um, level up your design skills with an eye towards testability. As you start writing more tests, think about how your design is. Um, <coughs> if you're doing object-oriented code, one of my biggest recommendations is for, there's a two book series, especially book number one called Elegant Objects. Um, it gleefully goes in and it steals a number of things from functional programming concepts. Um, it goes off and uh, leverages a whole sections of its philosophy from a book I read years ago um, called Object Thinking by David West, no relation. Um, and it's really kind of a, um, more philosophical and solid approach, no pun in acronyms intended, uh, to, to thinking about how you design objects. It, it leverages thinking about objects in terms of responsibility, anthropomorphizing objects. What is this object's responsibility? What does it want to do? Um, what does it need? Um, all that sort of stuff. It's a different, better way of thinking than just saying, oh, an object is just data with some methods bolted on. Um, that's not where the power of OO really comes from. And this book, in my opinion, helps you get a good handle about that, helps you improve your design. Take a look at how uh, your favorite language or your dominant language that you're working with in development, it's community, uh, this, the community's TDD supporters. Um, there's going to be all sorts of tools, libraries, and whatnot for any given language that are going to help you do TDD in that language or framework of choice. Um, I believe, as you saw the book that said X unit, that's because every language out there pretty much has those X unit testing patterns. Uh, it started off in small talk with S unit. Um, Kent Beck himself uh, wrote, famously wrote the first version of J unit on a flight. Um, and anything there, you know, keep, keep going with it. Um, it gets extended in some cases, even to some types of embedded or internal work. There's SQL unit. If you're going to uh, do really important um, embedded SQL calls uh, that support all sorts of different um, uh, languages and whatnot, different variations of, of SQL flavors and uh, stored procedure calls. So it's out there. Um, it's one of the the, the whole X unit patterns in any languages you can think of. 
Um, and again, uh, the support for TDD from the frameworks. I mentioned Rails and uh, testing for Active Record. All sorts of examples out there. Same thing for how you might grow and approach some of the service testing. Which then leads to tip number three, um, test doubles. All they really are is code that's standing in for other code in order to make your test easy. When you're working at something defined as a unit, some section of responsibility, a class, a function, whatever it might be, it's going to have to interact in a lot of cases with something else. There's a number of different ways to do this. You can do mocks. You can use stubs. You can use fakes. Be familiar with them. When you go out in the wild, you will see all of these. Some languages and toolings tend to favor or make it easier to use some things than others. JavaScript, um, Jest is a great mocking framework, and it is just easier to set up your tests and go through the overhead of learning the tooling and learning to read Jest and make it work than necessarily going off and creating stubs or fakes, specifically if you're working with a framework. React comes to mind. Stubs, in some cases, can be really natural. Uh, the, wonderful, uh, the wonderful thing about Java, um, not that a lot of people are big fans of it anymore, although there's still a lot of use of it, is that it is dead simple to create an anonymous instance of a class and stub out and override a method. Um, back when I was drinking from the fire hose, that was one of the most straightforward ways to get things working and moving along in the code we were working on at the time, was to do a stub. The overhead of mocks and some of the tools weren't there yet. It actually come along years later. Or in some cases, if you take the pragmatic approach, what's longer? Writing and understanding the mock, doing the stub, writing a fake. Um, I say research these because I think that those are things that are best left for you to understand and look at in the context of what you're doing. So tip number four. Um, <laughs> this is kind of a fun one. Uh, if you'll pardon the rap reference, uh, I'm more of a metal guy myself, um, although I do like some bits of rap here and there. But there are kind of two schools when it comes to how to do TDD. There is the Detroit or the Classicist School, um, which Kent Beck talks out about. And there is the London or Marcus School. Um, there are entire books written about this. The London School has a book called The Goose Book or Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests. And the Detroit School, well, the philosophy is, is that you're going to kind of explore things as you go along and get in as deep as you need to. Um, there's blog posts about this. I'm not necessarily going to take a position and say I like one better than the other. Um, I've done both in some cases. I mean, suggest that it may depend, of course, because I'm a consultant, it depends, um, on the inf amount of information you have in the context you're working in. If you have a lot of stuff that you're exploring on your own and you have full control over things, the classic approach, just going through and setting things up and making your code testable, it's got a lot of power to it. If you have more reliance on other teams, third parties, integration point, more abstraction, Taking the Marcus or the London School approach gives you better levels of isolation to only focus on one thing at a time. And again, the best way to find out what you better, like you better, try both. My last tip before moving on to getting further down the roadmap here. Um, number five, if you get the opportunity to do this, to host it, check out coderetreat.org and do a code retreat. Um, there's a little hint to what the code retreat is all about here on the right-hand side of the slide. It's Conway's Game of Life. That's actually called the Four Demons. I don't know what state sets that up. If you're interested in Conway's Game of Life, it's a zero-player game where you simulate life. It goes back to the early days of computing. Um, but Code Retreat is actually a really good opportunity to go in, spend a day, uh, doing TDD and pair programming six times or more with reflection and discussion. And by the time you run, you're done, you walk out of the room you've worked in with nothing, no code to show for it, nothing more than the fact that you have a better understanding and experience on TDD approaches. You've possibly tried it in different languages. 
you've gotten a better feel for a pairing with a stranger, complete stranger, and you get a better feel for the importance of focus practice. So I've gone through a bunch of tips. Let's get down to act three. Show this. Show this stuff. Great. You've learned all this stuff. Show it. Who do you show it to? First off, find a friendly audience. Um, if you've got coworkers, you've been digging into stuff, you've been looking at this. Uh, if you want to do this together as a journey, that would be awesome. Um, I have some coworkers who are doing this a bit as a journey. If I think it's a, a Adam and Cody code um, to my developer uh, friends at Industrial Logic do a, um, uh, a YouTube code cast on Sundays and they pick a code kata and they do it TDD. Um, you take the same sort of approach, uh, but find someone uh, to show, um, someone you're comfortable with and go through the basics. Um, show them FizzBuzz. Um, do make sure you're doing red, green, refactor. Show the three laws, demonstrate the three laws of TDD. Um, talk about the four rules of simple design. Um, and when you set up and do this, if you're getting your small audience, figure out, are they okay with using, do you think they'll accept Cyber Dojo online? Do they want you to bring up like the same tooling stack you have at work if it's a coworker? Um, would handing them a preloaded Git repo um, help and say, hey, load this up and then I'll stop by your desk uh, after work and you load this up and we'll sit at your desk and we'll do this or we'll do it virtually. Whatever that may be. So go ahead and show it. Um, and then after that part, things get trickier because you've seen it, you've done it, you're showing it, and now you have to figure out how you want to go further with this, advocating. Um, how to advocate. I think you need the right environment. Some organizations, uh, some teams within organizations may be more interested and more open to the concept of adopting TDD as a full-time team development practice uh, if they've got better uh, support from the iceberg. Um, they're already doing test last. Um, they have good code quality concepts. Um, bits and pieces of the architecture are pretty testable. Um, the refactoring uh, is viewed as a little bit more of the Boy Scout motto of, you know, you see a mess, clean it up. As opposed to saying, no, 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 if we're going to refactor everything, we have to have a big conversation about it and get the architects involved and do all this other stuff. Um, and in some cases, uh, the easiest way to do this, to be brutally honest, is that great opportunity called a greenfield. Um, when you have something that's greenfield, you can set up different expectations around what's happening and saying, we do TDD on this project. We pair instead of doing pull requests or we mob instead of doing pull requests, Wh whatever it is, finding the right environment that can make a big difference. Um, finding supporters, step two, other crafters, um, folks that, um, you know, have been bugging you about, hey, how's your TDD stuff going that you were talking about? When are you going to be able to show that? Um, maybe someone who went to a code retreat with you. Um, and then... In terms of the cast of characters, when you start talking about this, you're going to see a few different types of responses. Um, you're already the advocate. Um, you may quickly find that some folks are, are passionate followers. Um, folks may be uncommitted. Uh, you may get some vocal detractors. And the most dangerous one to deal with is the saboteur. Saboteur is the people or persons who come along and say, this TDD stuff is, isn't that it isn't important. It's, you know, there's, there's problems with it. And, uh, you know, they may go around uh, to your manager without you knowing and saying, I have some concerns about this TDD stuff. Um, being able to answer those questions, um, adapt and, and deal with those. Um, that's where the political stuff comes in. That's where advocacy can be uncomfortable for some people. But um, if nothing else, being aware of it and, and being honest um, if people come up and challenge you and say, you know, this is what I've seen, you know, this is, this is what the advantages that I find, you know, and, and have, try and have an open dialogue. Last but not least, um, at some point, hopefully you can go in and get to pilot. Um, like I said, 
greenfield projects. Uh, if you can get the green light and you were not going to get any pushback, that is your perfect situation. Um, it doesn't even have to be something large. If you've got need for a small utility to do something, uh, you and another coworker can raise your hand and say, hey, we want to do this little project, this little product that we're going to keep going, and we want to do it TDD, and we want to adhere to these practices, and we want to use that to demonstrate um, that this is going to build us better code. Um, at that point, it's straightforward. If it's not Greenfield, uh, if it's Greenfield, um, otherwise, going simple, finding whatever the product is, getting buying, buy-in, managing expectations, and showing results. Um, that's basically your best bet to get it there. You could do this all with something on your own open source, but you're not going to have quite the level of uh, well, the same amount of time if you're a professional full-time developer, and you're not going to have the same exposure and exercise the same muscles um, in terms of encountering challenges if you're doing open source approach to this as opposed to going in and working internally with company projects. So keep speaking of companies, I've got a, a little bit of a quick promo here. Um, my company, Industrial Logic, along with all of its training, has an e-learning platform that's been around for a while, but it's very effective. And it um, plugs into both Eclipse and um, IntelliJ IDEA, and it has some free katas. And this will give you feedback. If you go and check out the site, um, industriallogic.com.katas, and you take a look at our e-learning, the whole e-learning platform, the reason the plugin works is that it will actually catch you if you refactor on red. It gives you all sorts of reports, gives you feedback, it actually kind of plugs in and helps you improve your refactoring and TDD skills. Um, this is a promotional freebie. There's all other sorts of stuff on our um, e-learning platform, but I wanted to get that out there as a plug and something that people can take a look at. Um, this might be something that you want to do after you've started your basics uh, uh, to show one, do one. Um, this might be looking worth looking at, um, either your basic or advanced, somewhere in there as you're getting a good feel for it. And last but not least, in terms of a little bit of summary, um, thank you for uh, listening and taking the time. Uh, a few links here. Um, my email, garrickindustriallogic.com. Uh, fortunately, from my parents picking a fairly unique name for me when I was born, Garrick West is easy to find on LinkedIn. Um, or if you Google, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. Um, uh, sometimes cracking bad jokes, sometimes sharing interesting ideas. And um, also from, uh, from the discussion, from the discussion, the intro earlier, um, my profile from Industrial Logic. Um, my cats have been around here haven't distracted me too much, but um, I'm here in the Seattle area um, with my wife and my two pampered cats. And um, that is the one pinball machine that I broke down and I own. I don't have a problem. I can quit anytime I want. And um, yeah, pinball, learning to play guitar. I started at 50. Um, don't quit learning. So that's basically all I have. I'm uh, happy to uh, open up for questions. What a great session, Garrick. Thank you very much. I loved it personally. Uh, uh, among many of the takeaways, I would have, I would name, I would highlight two of them. Uh, one of them is that you really nailed it. That if we want to be successful with TDD, we need to be good at uh, TLD, so test uh, last development. So because they are, these are sort of requirements, right? I mean, writing quality tests, designing code, uh, these are sort of requirements to be good at TDD. And also we have to keep in mind that uh, TDD doesn't tell us how to design software, right? How to name our software elements, right? We need to name it. We need to know these uh, practices. And the second one, what I really liked, and I appreciate that you mentioned that Ncrunch, that's just them. That's just the best, really the best tool ever created. It just for, I miss me, it. The, for <laughs> me the greatest, greatest dopamine source uh, of software development. So, so everyone, if you use C Sharp, then check it out. That tool, check it out. That tool. Uh, it's called Ncrunch. Uh, I really, I can guarantee that it will be the best investment you can ever uh, do. So yeah, I, I'm, we're gonna we have uh, plenty of uh, remarks and questions. I don't know if 
I'm going to start to uh, go through them if uh, none of you have some additional points, Oliver or someone. Not much. Uh, great. Uh, then let's go through the questions. First of all, it is just a remark from Marcelo. A bit more because you you know you uh, mentioned the definition of TD, right? And after that, uh, we got a response from Marcelo. A bit more low level in the TDD definition. I find this tweet from Ken Beck insightful, and here it is. TDD is test first plus one test at a time plus just in time structure and behavior. Only enough logic to pass the test. Only enough structure to help write the logic. Um, I don't know. Uh, do we have something Excellent. here? Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a great quote. Uh, I think so. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, we got this question from uh, Giulio. Did someone ever work in a non-trivial project where TDD was adopted and where it heavily contributed to the success of the project? Uh, let me refactor this question. So, Garrick, have you ever... Uh, but tell us a project, tell us a non-trivial project where TD really contributed to the success of that project. So, well, um, actually, actually going back to um, that uh, the, the company that I worked for, my my first experience in 2004, um, the system that we built was um, you have to shift your mind back. Uh, in 2004, uh, smartphones were starting to become smart. Uh, they weren't exactly computers in your pocket. Um, and a lot of people uh, really kind of wanted to were pushing the envelope in terms of um, a mobile device technology. And so while you could get email, possibly Internet, most likely some some WAP and multimedia access on uh, on a Nokia phone, especially in Europe, um, it's uh, <laughs> I boo. it's um, it wasn't easy to set up and do. Uh, you had a Nokia phone and you had to go through 20 different screens in order to set up and configure your WAP gateway in order to get the Premier League football scores. Um, now, that's great when you're a user, but when you're a company that's a mobile carrier and you've got people calling up asking, how do I set this up on my phone? And you're spending 20 minutes telling them how to put in an IP address. It's crazy. And so the company I worked for basically figured out that there was a standard that you could do. Um, that was a WAP binary protocol, and you could push down a WAP encoded SMS into about mm, four or five encoded messages, use a pin code, and then all of a sudden, the person's device is configured. Needless to say, that got pretty popular. And we got a contract with Nokia, and we took something that had been done in C++, copied over, and started building out the, the back end server and then started redoing the entire front end that drove all the decisions and all the mapping capability and decided who's your carrier, what device do you have, and what do you want to configure with it? And it was really called mouse to mobile. And we did a whole rebuild of that because we had scalability problems. That was done completely test driven, pair programming, all the original XP concepts. And where it contributed to the success is that by the time we were done, that became a cash cow for the company. Um, we had, we were doing, actually doing kind of an extreme XP. We were doing XP around the world. There was a team in the UK, the team in the US, and the team in Singapore. I was part of the US team. We worked on the core platform. And where there were customizations and UI elements, each regional team would do work for clients in that region. And so we did 24 by 5 development. When things, a couple of times when things blew up or there was a problem, we did uh, 24 by 7 support around the world where one region might analyze a problem, diagnose it. It's 5 o'clock. We had a handoff about a half hour every day between each region. And we would hand off the support issue with the current information to the next team. No one stayed up till 1 o'clock in the morning. That was a huge success for developers. We literally handed support issues off. Oh, we've targeted down. We think it's here. US team figured out, oh, we've confirmed it. We've got a fix basically done. It's five o'clock here. Singapore, can you monitor and, manage the, uh, monitor and manage the deployment? Singapore managed the deployment. UK wakes up the next morning. The emergency issue that hit them at lunch that they handed off at five o'clock has now been solved. Um, that was one huge success in terms of the way the company worked. Um, like I said, in terms of going out in carriers that became a cash cow because it was so widely tested, 
And the next thing we did down the road, when that started to fall off a little, we created and resold a library that did all the device configuration and we sold that to carriers. I got to go down to South Africa and work on a product that was written in Spring Boot that wrapped the core library and sat in one of the largest telecoms in South Africa's data center and would handle requests coming in and devices came on roaming to the network that said, hi, welcome to our network. Here's your settings for email. Here's your settings for WAP. Here's your settings for MMS. If you have any questions, please contact us. And so we built that five guys in the U.S. region. That was our, our charter for a good nine months or so. And then we got a, a big contract and I went to South Africa two weeks and installed it. So huge success. And all of that was done with pair programming in TDD. And it all started out with one idea and the idea that if you support and manage the code, if you curate your code instead of throwing it away they had to do a rewrite the first time because there were no tests around it It is actually easier and ironically the back-end server it was a brute force port from c++ to java people renamed char for a character class renamed cpp to dot java and then used a regression test and eventually we got rid of that c++ server and fixed some memory leaks fortunately but yeah that, that was a classic wow. example. That was a huge adoption and change for the company. I will make one side note. There were some cultural problems for TDD and for some of the other aspects like pair programming. There were some people in the company in the UK who weren't comfortable with it, and they were given the opportunity to get on board with how things were being done. And when they decided not to, there was a bit of a layoff. And um, as you know, Europe or as I will willingly tell you, uh, Europe has much better and more comfortable employment insurance laws for the employee than the U.S. does. Um, the U.S., especially Washington State, has what's called right to work, which means my company can fire me today if they decide I don't like what I'm, they don't like what I'm doing, which would be unfortunate because this is today is my two, two year anniversary at Industrial Logic, by the way. Um, I started two years ago today. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's, that, that was a little bit of that caveat, but that was, really successful and TDD helped us do it. Congratulations for all this. It really proves that uh, TDD rocks, huh? <laughs> mm, I would say let's go into the next uh, remark or question. Uh, here it is from Marcelo. Yeah, there was a part where you were uh, recommending four books about software design and refactoring, and Marcelo said uh, you might also add implementation patterns from Ken back to the book list. That is a good suggestion, oh, yes. That's a good one also. Uh, here, another one which I really liked. I wonder what's your take on this. Uh, from Dan Torres, doing Fizzbuzz as a warm up every day before coding helps a lot. Following Steve Coe's advice, uh, interesting. Uh, yes. What's your take on this? Yes. We also do this, uh, or I'm, I'm, I'm biased. Uh, this is a uh, working uh, Steve is uh, another consultant at Industrial Logic. Oh. And um, full disclaimer uh, working at Industrial Logic um, with Steve now. It's actually the third time that I've worked with Steve. Um, <laughs> my first taste of consulting was back in. Um, around about 2012. And um, we started doing FizzBuzz, um, looking at FizzBuzz and, and working it as a Kata um, at a company called Solutions IQ, which since got bought out by Accenture. Um, he's a big proponent. I agree with him. Um, and um, we would do that regularly uh, where we worked together after Solutions IQ, which was Primera. Um, that was where I learned about NCrunch, dove in, a Java guy. Um, not knowing hardly anything except the things that I hated about Visual Basic in terms of the Microsoft universe. But I, I got comfortable and um, things, things I missed, like NCrunch, um, got very comfortable and fluent in saying, oh, Azure, yeah, that's a lot like AWS. These are just some different terms. You know, C Sharp, well, it's a lot like Java. No offense, C Sharp folks. Um, although I will give you credit, the language has moved on, done a lot better things in terms of the runtime. Um, and there are a number of things that Java is starting to catch up. But still, um, I was able to kind of move over because, you know, it's OO concepts, you know, all the design concepts, a little bit of the test tools. It's still, um, you know, uh, N unit is still for .NET is still an X unit pattern. Um, by the way, I've also done N unit. It will work with Visual Basic. 
Um, I worked for a client and helped them because they were using VB, um, showing them how to do um, VB.net to do um, end unit testing by pulling those libraries in and working with them. So, but yes, sidetracked, but yes, FizzBuzz, awesome, good warm up. Um, it's uh, it's a good um, it's a good good choice. All right, thank you for the answer. Uh, the next one is uh, from uh, Valentina herself. Uh, so, what's the pathway you use when adopting TDD in legacy projects that have little or poor tests? Mm. Exciting question. Right. Um, I think in some cases, getting um, taking a look at you know what we're called like pinning tests. Um, getting that test coverage initially in um, so that you can comfortably refactor and finding seams. I mean, you know, Michael Feather is working effectively with legacy code. Um, to me, it can be a matter of figuring out where is a seam of a module or a subsection or something that we need to want, want to work with or we want to work with that we can safely wrap with some tests and then start to change. Uh, characterization tests, kind of another word. Um, and so getting that wrapped before going in um, and then reworking it to me is the biggest step because you can have some gold standard tests that just run through and say, hey, we know cranking through all these values, we should do these things. And then being able to test them independently. Um, that's one thing. Another thing that can be useful if you're concerned about getting things deployed, um, doing trunk-based development. I'm a big flag of I'm a big fan of feature flags, and so I don't consider it duplication when you have an architectural refactor that says we're going to take a copy of this thing that we want to work with, we're going to start wrapping it with tests, and then we're going to have a feature flag that says. Here's the new tax calculation code that we've done TDD. And now we're going to put it in a test environment, load up all of the test data that the testers have collected, tag it under load, set that flag, and, and do it that way. And if something goes wrong, we're still not deploying that to production until we're ready to flip the flag and do it. Um, that's one of the cool things about trunk-based develop when you're doing trunk-based development and you can do it without but just feature flags in general when you're un when you're unsure or you need to literally test and validate an idea in terms of an architectural decision or a change there's a great safe way to do that and it's very reassuring to to management um to tell them by the way if we have any problem with this it's not like we've gotten rid of the old code it's sitting there you know it's innocent and still proven guilty now, if we can fix it, show all the problems with it, work out a few bugs, fix everything, and then prove it guilty, we'll rip it out of there. And the new code will be executing, and you'll be happy with it. Trust us, you'll love it. So, uh, That's definitely a good approach, how you mentioned. I mean, you first need those wider tests to, you know, wrap up, you know, essentially isolating the code in maybe some kind of modules or some kind of logical uh, elements because the whole project might be uh, too big of a scope. And then after you have the tests, that then you can attempt uh, either refactoring or architectural uh, redesign. So that, yep. that's, that's a good approach. Uh, and as you've mentioned, uh, getting the test coverage up, I mean, that, that's one way of getting some kind of safety in tests. So something that I like to use as well is, as you mentioned, test coverage and also mutation score. Yes, mutation. And definitely. then it means we can uh, start some uh, refactoring. So great. Thanks for that overview. Cool. All right. Thank you for the question and the answer. Let's jump to the next one. Oh, still is the answer to this from Marco. There is an overlapping of what we just mentioned. So he said, uh, write new code using TDD. If you cannot try to isolate part of the legacy code first, using techniques from working with legacy software. Uh, so yeah, that's what uh, we will also discussing yeah. with uh, Feather. Uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah, it's also not a question. It's just for me a remark. Uh, rep references are legit. <laughs> so I, I, I don't agree. think London versus Detroit was that bad. I mean, I was never at the meetups. 
Um, the, the whole London school actually I was well, and it started because of the um, uh, the X. I think it was the uh, Extreme Tuesday Club in London in the early two thousands, mm. and a number of the folks in there started doing that approach. Um, yeah, it's, I I don't think it's that bad, but but sometimes um, sometimes people have strong opinions. Personally, um, my my axiom for it is um, goes back to how much definition you have. Um, and a lot of times I'll end up driving something, you know, Detroit school and then realize that I actually want to break it out and make it more flexible. And then I'll end up moving my test coverage. So where tests where things normally went like end to end all the way through kind of in the classic mode, I end up intentionally putting in a fake and then moving the responsibility so that like that unit is tested directly um, kind of more as it was reverse growing object oriented software guided by test style. Um, so myself and another of a number of folks on the current project I'm working on end up doing that where we'll go through, we'll drive it to turret style all the way through. And then we'll say, Hey, you know what? I'd rather see this responsibility tested directly because I'm having trouble picturing the big picture. And now I want to zero in. And that's the advantage of having some of that um, approach where you've got things more directly tested. And again, like on the public interface. So, yeah, it's not about, yeah, I totally agree. It's not about choosing one school of uh, uh, testing. It's about sort of combining it and be pragmatic and sort of com combining them to get the yep. best result. And my take here with the rap references, I uh, personally, I like rap music. When I was young, I listened to these uh, West Coast, East, so East Coast, all these <laughs> things. So it's, it made, uh, made your presentation really fun. So great job. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the next uh, question uh, from uh, Douglas. Hi, everyone. Joining you from Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, I have been trying to implement integration tests uh, for Angular Ionic app. I'm a beginner TDD, struggling to target username and password Ion output box. And the second part is I'm targeting the HTML5 within the public login directory. Any handle resources? So maybe we could refactor also this question to what is your if of course if you have some specific answer to douglas please go for it if not uh, what is your take on and how do you test the ui the persistence level with td but how do you tdd the persistence layer i would say right at, at the high level sometimes with issues like that especially when you're talking about authentication um my first question is because this sounds like this is something being pushed by an angular framework is turning back to the Angular community and seeing, is there a way when I'm running tests that I can disable this or that I can make assumptions about a, uh, injecting um, a fake authenticator? Uh, I know Spring, I believe, has a way to do this. And so this, this is one of those things where when you, unfortunately, of course, we, we, have, to use, we have to use tools and framework because we can't do everything ourselves from the ground up and you know leveraging those gives us the opportunity to build great things the other side of that coin is if the tool in question hasn't done a very good job of supporting testability um sometimes you have to get creative sometimes the answer might be not necessarily to try and drive through the html and the web ui but to step back and say well how much of my business logic system of the code that I care about, can I move away from that login, possibly? Do I bother to test login? Or is that something that I just do because I know it's set up by the tool? And I say, let's assume my user's logged in. Now let's pull out some of these you know, elements from a controller or something like that, or from a component. And then all of a sudden, once, once you have something where none of that framework is pulled in and you're in your imports, then you can do whatever you want. Right, it's Angular, right? So it's JavaScript or TypeScript. Uh, if you're not importing any Angular in some functions or classes that your components using, you can test whatever you want. And so, ironically, sometimes with frameworks, the correct answer is rip it away from the framework, or set aside and make the assumption that's that's user authentication. You know, Angular's got that covered. I won't be concerned about it. And then when your tests run you're fine because you're working down at the level of where am I delivering business value? Because that's, that's a difficult part. It's easy, it's easy to get caught up on, well, gosh, I really want to do this end to end. Well, if, if the tool's fighting you, the answer is either rip it away or accept that 
I'm going to have to have a little part of my process where I do want to manually test this. Excellent answer, yep. I think. Uh, let's go on to the next one. We have uh, plenty of questions still. Uh, some people uh, put some more, so it's very good. Mm, the next one is, uh, of course, thank you for the answer. Uh, here we have one from Tolun and Bama. Uh, do you have any dat data, articles, etc., to show how TDD improved improve the throughput, velocity, quality, etc.? It would help us sell the idea to bottom line oriented executives. Wow. Right. Um, one of the ways to, one of the best ways to approach that in terms of metrics that, um, that I think are worthwhile, um, is going out and looking at, I don't know that we've collected any or if there's any out there, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are studies that have done specifically around what's, you know, hot in the DevOps world, which are the Dora metrics. And when you start going and talking to executives about what's our mean time to recover from failure, how frequently can we deploy and how that impacts the business, sometimes you don't necessarily have to, to show, um, you know, in terms of like velocity, but when you start talking about deployment and getting features out and recovery from errors, and then I'm trying to remember there's also the number of times there's been deployment failures or you've put out a bug. When you start looking at those in aggregate, that's where you can, well, this is going to sound bad. Um, it's easy to pick on projects that don't have TDD because there's less confidence around deploying them. They almost automatically discount themselves out. And so you could look at it from how do I sell this? But if you turn around and say, if I simply say that I can demonstrate that code that has good qualities driven by TDD, improve our deployment, cut our downtime, do all this other stuff, then you're, you're kind of spinning the answer about the metrics showing the dollar. You can say, we can't, well, the, the dollars are relative. That's the other fun thing. Um, companies will do stuff because the executive made a promise in public. Um, how many people have run into that in their careers? Gee, why are we investing a team of 10 and, you know, seven months to do this? It's like, well, the CEO stood up at a trade show and said we'd do it. He didn't talk to us? Yeah, that never happens. Um, so dollars can be tricky. But showing effective deployment and the fact that, you know, Agile in general and TDD and, and CI and all that XP stuff helps you improve those Dora metrics. To me, that's the killer argument. Um, mm -hmm. let, let them infer the dollars. Or let them infer, uh, if nothing else, let them infer the uh, improved opportunity. You know, what could you do if we could deploy every day? Instead of telling them, we need training for TDD, say, what, what would you be able to do if you could deploy every day? What would you do if you could turn on features for 10% uh, of your users in order to pilot something? Because we haven't done any feature flagging. You know, ideas like that. Separating deployment of the code from the availability of functionality. Does it take more work? Yes. If you decide to back that out and then there's database schema changes dependent on it, yeah, you have to understand how to reverse <laughs> those schema changes. <laughs> folks, I'm sure you've done stuff like that too. <laughs> the number of the folks here, you know, oh, they don't want that feature anymore. Great. Well, we've got all these columns now. Well, we're going to have to migrate them out. So, mm -hmm. and that's where the business starts to learn too. They start to appreciate what we're doing more. Exactly. And I want to add uh, here a point. Uh, sometimes uh, immediately making an argument for TDD might be too hard, depending yep. on the organization. The one which I find is a lot easier in terms of argumentation is the need to have automated tests to protect against regression bugs. Mm -hmm. And essentially um, talking about the challenges that the teams currently have in terms of the amount of regression bugs they have, the amount of manual QA that they have to be doing, and how automated tests would help, let's say, save time and reduce regression bugs. Those are the arguments which, to the, what I've observed, are much easier to buy in. And then after people have bought into the need for test automation argument, then we could drill into, okay, test automation last, versus test automation the um, TDD way.
All right, thank you for the answers. Uh, let's jump to the next one. It's an exciting question uh, again uh, from Nacho. Uh, what's your opinion about using AI for writing code? Have you used in any case? Do you recommend it, for example, for writing tests when you don't have it? Gerg, what is your? You know, it's kind of funny. I I really haven't tried. Um, I was kind of curious, and a few months ago, I went on to Google Bard, um, and um, being an only child. Uh, I asked it about myself. I thought, okay, so I've done enough stuff and I've done things on the internet. Uh, Google Bard uh, gave a profile that was kind of fascinating that said, um, uh, in terms of hallucinations, that um, I had spoken at a number of conferences. It's not really true. I, I spoke at, um, uh, I think, one of the 2014 um, uh, a big Agile conference that was in New Orleans. And I was talking about bringing Agile into the classroom. And I made a presentation with the teacher I worked. We flipped doing things old school, getting requirements to using Scrum and getting better involvement. Worked out real well. But it said I'd spoken at multiple conferences. And it said I wrote a book, which was really fascinating. Um, and so I thought to myself, okay, I just asked for some basic stuff here. And it's hallucinating some interesting things. Um, I don't know that I'm interested in digging with code. So I haven't really looked at code. But um, Jason Gorman, um, who I follow on LinkedIn, I'm a big fan of a lot of stuff that he does. He's a big proponent of software craftsmanship. Um, I've read some of the stuff that he's talked about doing. And the general takeaway for what he looked at was that it wasn't worth it. I've also had a number of colleagues who have gone in and played with, uh, what is it, Google Cold Pilot um, on the React Native project that I'm currently working on. Um, we've got multiple mobs. Um, usually every day I'm on camera mobbing, which is, you know, if I don't seem uh, uh, too distressed, um, that's part of the reason why I'm used to being on camera all day in a mob. Um, but uh, a few months ago, they, they slowly kind of turned it off because it would start ridic uh, suggesting ridiculous things. Um, I know people have talked about doing this. I have yet to see anyone who said, yeah, this is fantastic. It also breaks the fundamental rules of TDD in terms of Uncle Bob's three laws. Because if you're having the AI write a bunch of failing tests, you've written a bunch of tests that are failing instead of just one. So maybe that's test before. Maybe that's AI vision test. I don't know what you call that. But I don't necessarily think that's TDD. And the one thing that bothers me is that doing that might make a bunch of assumptions about design that you haven't benefited from by going through the TDD cycle. The fact that you're focused on one thing at a time, what responsibilities are, where they are, as you get more experience doing TDD, the idea of doing something like that for AI when it doesn't necessarily know your context I mean, it's predictive. I mean, we've seen it. everyone says AI right now. Let's be honest; it's large language models. Um, one of my favorite jokes is, uh, in terms of picking on AI, I will I will say uh, there was an episode of um, How I Met Your Mother, of uh, a popular sitcom in the United States, and the the folks talked about uh, um, you know uh, smoking illicit substances, but they talk about eating sandwiches. So when the guy is telling the story to his kids, it's like, yeah, yeah, me and your uncle, we used to eat a lot of sandwiches. Um, and I thought about that phrase. It's just like, so imagine that I'm telling an LLM that I go out to lunch with a bunch of friends and we're real good and we're real close and we know each other so well that, you know, we go to the same sub shop and, you know, we have great conversations and every once in a while we will end up finishing each other's sentences I bet the LLM will say sentences. I was going to say sandwiches <laughs> because it doesn't hold the whole context. And so that's my number one concern a lot around the hype of these language models is that it's trying to predict, number one. And number two, it's trying to predict the stuff that's already written. <laughs> so long term, I have to wonder if no humans are doing quality code, what are those systems going to borrow from? And at what point do open source developers slap on things? And I've already heard of it right now. I think the New York Times did that says, AI, go home. They put something in the robot.txt file that says, don't use this for generating AI. 
Um, I know OpenAI right now is really concerned because a number of authors are talking about um, you're violating copyright. So there's some really weird stuff in terms of the intersection of computer science, science fiction, current culture, and law that I think is going to come to collision regarding AI. I don't think we're need to panic anytime soon in terms of being replaced, what I've seen so far. Great answer. I can uh, only agree with this. And I think also the biggest problem with AI-generated code that we cannot trust it. Right, and it's a big deal. I mean, if we cannot trust oh, yeah. the code, what we are producing, that's a big deal. That's what we want to achieve. We want to have high confidence in the code we produce. And if we have something which we can trust, then what we are doing. So really, we have to be, we have to always refine and think about it. Well, yeah. the time is over, uh, Garrick. What a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we are grateful that you've been here. Uh, and many thanks also for the co-organizers and the co-hosts, and of course to the audience. Uh, we were uh, technical excellence, learn how to deliver quality sub, uh, software faster. And I would say uh, see you at the next time. Have a good evening and have a good day further. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.